right now. All right, so we'll continue our discussion on MEMS and more specifically, we'll see bio MEMS. This, this picture is from UAE. A few years ago, I was there at American University Sharjah, I think. So that's where this picture was. Yeah. All right, so we'll continue. All right, so MEMS, the history is, it started somewhere around middle of last century when they were working with single crystal silicon, single crystal semiconductor materials to be precise. We were using germanium and then silicon was something that we were able to fabricate, single crystal silicon. I'm just showing a zoomed up uh, view of the table I showed last time. Because at around that time, the integrated circuit was invented and then so on and so forth. So there is a an interesting paper about it that uh, the TA will be sharing with you and that's where the, the homework for this module will be also from. But MEMS is a direct result of doing things at micro scale. So being able to create devices repeat, reproducibly make those devices at micro scale. So there are some processes and some terminology that goes with that. So we will look at some of the terminology, micro machining. Just like we do machining at large scale, when we go to micro scale, we call it micro machining. And the idea is that uh, we can make things with this at micro scale and we can characterize them. We can define their uh, parameters, we can characterize them. and But this is very application oriented, depending on, so we have a bunch of tools, a bunch of processes that we can take, and we can use them to create a micro device of our choice, whatever we want to make. And those structures that we made at, make at micro scale, then we can use them to do sensing or actuation, whatever you like. Right, so MEMS, it has electrical part and mechanical part both. So we use this, a bunch of technologies, processing technologies to do that. And what we get is it may be a, an electrical signal from that or maybe non-electrical signal, depending on whatever the application. It may be we are measuring resonant frequency. It may be we are measuring mechanical stress. It may be we are measuring an optical change in, in during that interaction or whatever mechanism, biological mechanism we are trying to see. So it's, so every MEMS device has its own design and its own end use. And what we do in micro machining, we use the conventional and, and novel semiconductor processing uh, techniques or technologies. And they include, I've listed a bunch of these and we'll look at many of those much more closely. Etching, deposition, photolithography, oxidation, epi, epitaxy plating. And then there are a little bit more uh, extensive like deep RIE. It's basically an etching mechanism. So what we do is we apply these technologies or these processing technologies to create structures of our choice. So here I'm showing you the difference between uh, how we make things at large scale and how we think, make things at a small scale. So there are two types of micro machining we do. One is called bulk micro machining and another is called surface micro machining. And the difference is if we, are, we, we have a silicon crystal, for example, or any crystalline material. We, if we go inside the bulk, inside the body to create something, we call it bulk micro machining. But if we build something on top of that and use that crystalline or silicon material just as a holder, we call it surface micro machining. So what's happening here is on the left hand side, two pictures where you see that blue kind of ranging. We are using that blue material to create a pattern and then through that pattern or that opening, we are etching the light blue material on the left-hand side. 
on the right hand side in the middle picture where we are showing there are, uh, we start with the substrate and we'll look at all these things much more closely but what's happening here is we start with the substrate here and then we put some material on top and we leave some opening but we are using it just to design because the next step we deposit this red material and get rid of this green material. So what we end up having is a is kind of a suspended uh, thing. It's it's like jumping board in a swimming pool, you know, diving board. These are like suspended boards, hold up from the end. The other side is, is free to move. We call it a cantilever. We'll talk about cantilevers also later on. But the idea is that we can either create structures within the bulk or we can create on top. This right hand picture is, is a, a little bit elaborate of showing that we can create micro cantilever by a bunch of steps. Right now we just, the idea is that look at these things and we see that how do we create 3D structures or 3D shapes at, a, at micro scale. So we use these bunch of technologies or techniques now, these processes, they come in order. We start with like from the top, we start with a, a, a substrate. Substrate, we call substrate like a, any structure or basically a silicon wafer on which we will be building things on top or within these things. We pattern the design and there is a process, it's called lithography. We look at lithography a little bit in more detail. We use that pattern to create, let's go back. We use that pattern to create the design that we want to make. So in this case, we just want to make a square shape thing. So material in square shape is transferred. Then what we are doing is we are using this as a template to remove this gray area. And this is called first etching. So etching, there'll be more etching steps. So but etching is chemical removal of a material. So once we remove that, we are left with this, only this gray area, this gray material. And now we cover the whole thing with some other material, blue material, which is shown with the blue color. Now, once that's put on the sur surface, we can remove the underlying material or we can keep on building on top of that. So we put a pattern, in a material on top of that and use that to etch this part, part. If you remove etch this part, we are left with this kind of shape. So now in this shape, then we can etch the gray area also. And what we are left with is, is a micro scale suspended kind of structure. What we do with this structure, we'll look at the examples of what are the usage of these kind of structures. But the basic idea is that at micro scale, we use a bunch of uh, processes to create those structures that we were looking at last time, right? Now, if in 2D, if I were to show the steps of my fabrication and, and we design these, we design on paper, then we ultimately transfer them in actual fabrication of these things and etching them. So in this case, for example, we start with the silicon wafer we are shown with, with yellow. We put two layers of some polymer on both sides to protect it. And we use that polymer to, to create a pattern, a design, which is shown with blue. So we use that blue area, that area we remove material, and then we use that opening to go down and create some trench or this kind of pocket within the substrate. We can create another one and we can, instead of just doing some etching or some duct, we can go straight down and create a deep etch. So this is a kind of a deep trench we can make in silicon vapor. Or we can just have small doping done where we just implant some other elements into the substrate. Now we can open 
a window from the other side as well and use that to etch all the way. So what you would be left with is a feature which is suspended in the air and it's just a membrane. So this area is just a thin membrane, which is being held from across four sides, but it is just a thin layer. What we do with thin layer, we'll, we'll look at that also. This can be a pressure sensor, for example. Another example, again, we start with the, with the substrate. In this case, we are showing it with green. And we can coat it from both sides with some material and, and create pattern and use that pattern to remove material from those places. And then we can put metal on top. So then a bunch of metal that we can use gold, copper, so tungsten, there are rare metals which we use as well. So we can use that and we can remove material from below. Now what we have is a thin membrane which is suspended which is which can be freely moving. What do we do? We can put another layer on top and we can create metal connections with that. So here what we are showing is we have put the, uh, the golden or, or yellowish colored metal in there. And in that metal, we can use another kind of material or we can just etch away the metal to create access to that. So these are, different ways how we can create microfabricated materials. Now an end product would look something like this, where this mass or that suspended membrane can be used to measure pressure, for example. And what we can do is, for example, these are just two examples. There are many other examples of how you can make a pressure sensor. So in this case, now this is the whole membrane and there is mass suspended, let me change the color, and there's mass suspended. Now change of this mass, if something accelerates, this mass will get shifted because of inertia. And this shifting can be measured with the piezo resistant material at in these thin parts. And this can be measured by a, a signal that we get in an outside system. It can be current, it can be voltage, whatever we do. Another way how you can do this is a capacitive measurement. So we make those micro scale features and then we have two layers of metal and there is a capacitive, there's capacitance in between. Now, if this moves, this membrane thin part, again with inertia would move because of one side is held, the other side is, is thin, so it can, it's flexible. So that movement can be measured by change in capacitance. Again, a signal can come out, right? So these are examples of what may be there at the heart of a MEMS device. All right, so a piezo-resistive material is a material that there, it's a transducer. It converts one type of energy to another. It, if you have a piezo resistor material, if you push it, it, can, it generates a voltage. So, or if you apply a voltage, it can expand or shrink. So piezo resistor materials are, it, they're called piezo materials and piezo materials are basically, which are, which convert mechanical to electrical or electrical to mechanical energy. They're special materials. So that piezo, the change or the strain in that mass because the whole body is moving, but that mass is suspended with those thin membranes, that would be with the force of inertia, there'll be some pull to it. And that pull can be measured by the change in the resistance of the edges. So there are other applications. You can put other kind of sensors there also. You can put interdigitated electrodes. So there are many, many examples how you can measure that inertia or that acceleration in a, in a system. Uh, sir, uh, sir? Yeah. Uh, how can, uh, I mean, just twisting something uh, can increase its, can change its resistance uh, in this case? So that's the, the fantastic thing about piezo materials. So piezo materials, if you look up, you'll be amazed. Piezo materials do exactly that. If you pressure them, if you push them, they generate a voltage. 
or if you gen, if you apply voltage, they would expand or shrink. So these materials can convert electrical energy to mechanical from their expansion or shrinking, or they can measure the shrinking or expansion in, in a voltage form. So piezo materials are special kind of materials. These are commonly available. These are used in, in almost uh, in a lot of sensors or actuators where you want to measure the movement or you want to measure how a pressure, how much of a pressure is applied on something. So they're using piezo materials for renewable energy applications as well. They, they say that if you, if you put a piezo material on floor and people walk, that pressure can be converted into electrical energy. So piezo is a, is a special kind of material. If you look it up, you will find many fantastic applications of piezo materials. Right? So MEMS has lots of companies who are producing MEMS. So there is this Texas Instrument, Delco. I give you the examples of uh, light projection, right? Which uh, is in projectors. Accelerometers, they have gyros, micro machine gyros, which can measure north and which can keep track of uh, how things are moving, all that. So it says integrated or two chip. Integrated is when you make everything in one chip in itself. Or two chip is if you make two parts on two chips and you bond them together, you bring them together. Just hang in with me. We will look at these processes later on as well. How do we, how do we make a chip? Or what are some processes that go into making those chips? All right, so MEMS. Sir, are... sir, I had a question. Uh, I had a question regarding the pressure sensing material you showed on the previous slides. Can, can you kindly uh, please go back? Uh, so you are, you are on mute as well. Uh, uh, sir, uh, on the previous slide. I'm on muted because I'm sneezing. Just give me a second. <sighs> I have lots of allergy. Oh, right, you want me to go further? Uh, yeah, it said on the previous slide. Um, sir, so here on the second kind of materials, you have, uh, I'm, I'm still not sure what that AL means that's labeled in the diagram. And secondly, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. If I'm wrong. Uh, uh, how do you uh, sort of measure the pressure uh, in this case? Is it because the lay, the distance between the two lay, two mem, two uh, what, what do you call it? Is it because distance of the two layers uh, that is being decreased so that the capacitance changes and you say that pressure is being applied or is there some other factor at work here? Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. It's it's aluminum. Al is aluminum. So capacitor, <laughs> two aluminum plates. The distance between them changing would be changing the capacitance between them. Capacitance. All right. right. So when now if you look at the upper part, if that's part of a system which is moving, if it moves too fast, there'll be a the membrane is is flexible, right? So it will it will bend. So that will bring two aluminum plates together closer to each other. So their internal capacitance will change. Okay. So similar way, so pressure is basically when you press something, things move. How do we measure the move? Is that's where we are using these either capacitive, and these are just two examples. There are many, many more examples of how you can measure the pressure applied or change in momentum. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, but sir, uh, we're talking nanoscale here. So, I mean- uh, We are uh, micro yet. The, so we are these, micro uh, scale so far. So these aluminum plates may be atoms thick. Right, so, exactly. So the plates themselves or the layer of these things would be very thin, few atoms thick, 100 nanometer-ish. So that makes them much, much more sensitive. But, but we are thinking them classically as capacitors and their plates and squeezing together. I mean, uh, the we physics of micro. this will, should be yes. different. Right now we are in micro, we are talking about MEMS. We are talking about micro electromechanical systems. 
So from micro, we see MEMS, we'll get into how we make MEMS because those are the technologies or their advanced version that go into creating nanoscale materials, nanoscale things. So yeah, we are starting from MEMS. That's where we'll go further down. All right. Yeah, so far we are in mechanical, oh, sorry, MEMS region. So that now these are some of the actual products that are made. So this top one is, and these are not new, these are, this some, is an old technology, but they're still in part, they're still in production and they create the, those technologies that we are now using to make things at nanoscale, right? So microfabrication, the, the whole, all the processing steps, are exactly used for, or their advanced versions that are used for making things at narrow scale. So, so here the three examples, one is accelerometer. The lower one is those digital light projection. A bunch of arrays of mirrors, which are given different lights, hence we get very high resolution image from reflection of those lights, All right? The upper right-hand thing is, a probe for atomic force microscope. Now we'll talk about AFM later on, but what this thing is, so it is like a, it is a cantilever and cantilever is, the example of cantilever is the diving boat or swimming pool, right? It's connected from one side, but free from the other side. When you make it in micro scale, we call them cantilevers. And it's a mechanical term, mechanical engineers, they know cantilevers. What we do with that is, we use cantilevers for a whole bunch of things. Here in AFM, cantilevers have these tips, what is shown at, at below it, a very sharp tip, a very sharp needle. Sorry, tip, in US they call tip, which is the same thing like needle. It has a very sharp needle at the end and they drag this on a surface. And if there is a feature, the needle will be pushed up, the whole cantilever gets pushed up. So we measure the change in the height of cantilever, which directly translates to the nanoscale features on the surface that it's dragging on. But that's a micro machine part for the most, except the tip, except the, uh, the pin part, everything else is made by micro machining. MEMS, all right? So one more example, and then we'll get into Biomens, because they, that's where we'll start looking at both sides of bio side and engineering side. Now, these are examples of the packaging of accelerometers or packaging of microchips. So the left side is showing an accelerometer. It's an airbag chip. You know, new cars, they have airbags and airbags deploy. When do airbags deploy? And then it accidents. Accidents. Basically, they look for sudden change in acceleration, sudden deceleration for that matter, right? Impact results into sudden deceleration. And they are designed to measure high change in acceleration. And that's where this acceler accelerometer would generate a signal that would deploy the airbag, right? On the right side, upper one is a microphone, is a, is a micro scale MEMS based microphone. What does a microphone do? What's the basic fundamental process of a microphone? We talk, it generates electrical signal, right? How does it generate electrical signal? the waves that we create. So microphone is, has membranes. It's, it's no different than a speaker. You guys have seen speaker, right? People used to have these woofers and tweeters. So what does they do? It vibrates. That's what it does. And the vibration creates waves and we hear the waves. The microphone is reverse. When we speak, there are membranes that vibrate and they pick up the waves and convert those, mechanical 
waves into electrical signals. The lower one is where you see actual cavity, which has a silicon membrane at the bottom. And it is connected only from four corners there. It, it's, it's amazing how small, so only thing that's connecting this squarish membrane, which is this membrane, it's suspended in air only the, through these four connections with the, with the substrate itself. So it's, we start with the whole thing, we keep on etching, etching, etching until we get to the thin membrane and that's where we stop. And what we get is a membrane that can do many things. It can be used as a microphone, it can be used as a, as a speaker for that matter, it can be used to sense things, right, movement. Now, so far we have been talking about big things or uh, common sense thing. Now we need to get into biomems. What does MEMS have to do with biology? Yeah, questions. Uh, sir, I have a question. Uh, in the last slide, slide you said that uh, airbags use these sensors uh, which measure certain deceleration. So if a car applies brake before accident, uh, air airbag does not open. So why doesn't it uh, rust in that case? Although there is a certain deceleration and there is no accident. Uh, so, uh, okay, I, I don't know why would that happen. All I can think of is the manufacturer may not have made them sensitive enough or the manufacturer may have not tested them in all the situations. And you know, by the way, there are many Many times it has happened that cars have been recalled, cars have been taken back by big companies because their airbags deployment system had faults in it. And this is exactly the kind of fault that you are highlighting that if you break too fast and, and then you have accident, how would it know that there was sudden deceleration or not? But yeah, you're right. These are the kind of testing they're supposed to do before they put them in the cars and, and Common people like us feel secure or we have airbags and when we need them, they don't deploy. Or when we don't need them, they deploy. Both cases should be tested thoroughly. But yeah, you're right. But that would go to what kind of sensitivity they define for it to actuate, right? So that would be the function of what signal should uh, deploy a bag or not, right? So in the last, in the previous slide, from this slide. Yes, uh, from this can, one. Yes, sir. Can you uh, please briefly tell again what is the DMC chip and uh, how it works? I could so talk about it. what it does is, so you have, okay, you see this chip, which is shown very small here. Let me see. Can, so you see this chip. What it, the chain color, it said, what it has is it has thousands of small microscale mirrors like this. Each mirror is addressable. Each mirrors, each of those mirrors is actuated. Now, when you have light source coming, now there are three colors, three fundamental colors. This has to reflect back from each mirror. So if it's, uh, you know, pixels, how many pixels, how many colors, the higher the pixels, the more the resolution. So these mirrors would reflect different colors, which would result into a shiny and bright picture. So each one of those is actuated to polarize or to be on and off, depending on whatever the picture needs to be made on the screen. So, so it, each mirror has, if you look at it, it has connection with the substrate on two sides with which we can actuate it to turn either way. So we can adjust if it's supposed to be reflecting or not. And there is, I think there is polarization coils at the bottom which would define what kind of light it has to reflect back. And I think we can use them in cameras or 
light de optical devices this is this is an optical device yeah so the idea is that we have thousands or millions of even small mirrors who are reflecting different colors and hence we get high resolution picture high resolution image on the on the screen uh, sir uh, how do we control uh, the, uh, the the color they reflect i mean whether a certain mirror reflects red or blue so polarization we can change so light when you go down the light there are two waves that are traveling so you can adjust the polarization of light but with these electrical signals actuation coils behind those mirrors but i mean uh, the light color comes from its frequency right so i mean polarization has nothing to do with it i, I mean the wavelength right. and you may be right i think it may be they they deflect in a different direction so the light doesn't come to the to the lens i frankly i don't know the in depth detail of how does a dmd chip work <laughs> I but uh, 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 another question another question uh, uh, we we are thinking uh, and i'm not comfortable with uh, the classical picture of like uh, light coming on a mirror and reflecting off that mirror i mean these uh, these are micro scale devices i mean what do you mean by mirror at this scale so these are small mirrors okay what i'm doing is i'm looking for dlc dlp chip operation right now i would just google and look for more details on how does a dlc chip work okay yeah mo well, my goal right now is to show mems in how we make things small for different application dmd chip oh yeah there lots of lots of information on on the basic on the operation of a dmd chip which uses mirrors made of aluminum to reflect light to make the picture is often referred to as dlp chip how does a dmd chip work it has several hundred thousand microscopic mirrors arranged in a rectangular array which corresponds to the pixel in the image to be displayed the mirrors can be individually rotated plus minus 10 to 12 degrees to an on or off state so that are they managing the colors that they reflect back or not and sir uh, this uh, this probe of afm right and then, like this has to be really really sharp like i mean if it's if it if, if it is a few atoms thick then Atomic, i mean i can't uh, atomically sharp now it, this is very interesting how sharp it is supposed to be it has to be sharper than the than the feature we are trying to image right if it is thicker than that it would just uh, you right this, these are called artifacts think about it if i uh, yes think about braille codes you know braille codes we are the, the blind folks they have to feel the braille code with their fingers right so if they put on gloves can they feel braille code they cannot right so the fingers or the probe has to be of appropriate size to image or to to sense whatever size we are trying to see if i if i am trying to like image uh, a metallic lattice for example the diatoms and their separation so this this probe has to be in an, an atomic length thick and the, the tip of it should be the one atom tip has to be sharp up to one atom right yeah exactly so how can we how can we make such a thing right yeah so they they don't make atomic atomically sharp tips but they make up to i think 2 3 nanometers is the radius of curvature of the tip so and we'll get into afm we'll get it we'll look at the tips so the the metric for the tip is radius of curvature right at the at the very end it is a half circle if you think about it so how thin can you make it that the 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 high end tips are very expensive exactly because of what you are saying they have made tips with carbon nanotubes as well now carbon nanotube would be few atoms few atoms rolled up in a circle think about it and then we can find the radius of curvature of that right yeah so that's the goal that you make those tips thin enough and cheap enough 
but they become expensive when you get real high end ones right yep uh, sir is this the same uh, like we studied stem scanning uh, tunneling microscope is there a difference between these two? okay now the tip of stm and tip of afm may look the same but they are very different the tip of afm tip of stm has to be conductive tip of tip of afm does not because in stm or scanning tunneling microscope we have a very sharp tip in that is what we measure we don't touch the surface but we are measuring tunneling current from that sharp tip and the surface for stm the sample has to be conductive as well but these are this is lecture on microscopes coming later we will look at these things but you are right this is these are important observations that they may look the same but in one case it's, it's scanning tunneling it's supposed to be current tunneling current that we use we are going forward and if this if the tunneling current increases which means there is an object coming up in that case the feedback system will move it up to get back to that tunneling current that it was supposed to have right and that move up will be registered as the shape of the material whatever is there if a stm is moving and the tunneling current goes down which means there is a there is some feature which is going down on the surface so then it the feedback system moves it down to follow the the whatever the pattern on the surface is but in case of afm we are dragging on the surface and if there is a feature that feature will physically move it up and then it comes down there are issues there also that when the feature comes the wall of the feature may not directly touch the tip and, and hence your tip will show a bigger feature than it actually is these are called artifacts so there are microscope artifacts errors which we have to correct or which we know before we do that these corrections need to be applied and computer does that for us all right very good so mems we make them stay a lot of things at micro scale now what is their application for biology what can we measure in biology or what kind of things would we like to measure in biology can somebody uh, guess what would we want to do with biology blood pressure cell count cancer cells number of amount of cancer all right so these are specific uh, kind of targets we are talking about but generally what would a biomems device do or a system structure of biomolecules like dna rna etc. so we want yes dna rna but dna rna are at nano scale but yeah there are bigger things we want to measure there are bigger things we want to manipulate as well so by definition it's a device and system which we create by micro nano scale fabrication to do what so there are few keywords that we want to do with them we want to process deliver manipulate analyze or construct bio and chemical entities so you'll see we are we are covering many different directions We want to process bio or chemical entities. We want to deliver. We want to manipulate, analyze, which would be a sensor, or we want to construct these entities at that scale. So this is a broad definition of biomem. So when I say broad, we may not look at all of them, but we the goal is we get some feel or some idea that what can we achieve at micro scale. And generally they would cover the devices micro scale they may be sensing something that is nano scale like you said dna or rna and they have applications in a huge dimension who huge number of applications now if i look at this part which says analysis so that's generally what we call sensors 
right? So, and when we talk about sensors for biology, we are more interested, or a lot of time we are interested in diagnostics, right? So that's what we are saying, can, cancer cells. That's where we would say uh, glucose levels. But we already have devices which do that. But when we want to see very small change in a, in a molecule, very small change of a molecule, very small change of a system, then this becomes more important that we use MEMS devices or nanoscale devices. So three, four areas of huge research, diagnostics, new materials, new materials and new platforms like microfluidics. Now we are doing 3D bioprinting, right? So we are creating 3D structures and we are growing living cells on top of that. Why would we want to do that? Any idea why would tissue engineering is generally dealing with cells? Why would we want to bioprint or 3D print biological cells? So that we can uh, kind of replace organs. I mean, can't really replace organs, like we can. Uh, right, so that's, in, that's something, yeah. The, that's called regenerative medicine, where you want to create organs in in petri dish or a, or a, or a lab, and then we want to implant. But when we talk about biomass, we are more on sensors, or we want to maybe give something to the system. I'll give you an example of bioprinting or or three D structures. So lungs, for example, right now there's lots of work going on. We are doing some work on it also. That can we grow lung cells in a similar environment on a 3D structure. You know, lungs, they have, they have uh, small air pockets where air exchange takes place. And there's very special cells who do that. Lungs expand and shrink. So we are trying to make 3D kind of structures which can expand and shrink as well. And then you want to grow cells on top of that so we can emulate or simul not similar, emulate, like copy what actually happens in a living system. So that's kind of tissue engineering that goes into that. When we make implants, we might want to put coatings that the body does not reject, right? Body rejects the foreign materials. That's where a lot of times we, we do testing in test tubes, petri dish, in vitro, we call them in vitro. And then we do in vivo testing in animals and ultimately they go for, for human. The second major area from biomems is what's called lab on a chip. Do you guys, have you heard lab on chip before? Lab on chip, the, the simple idea is that we have uh, all the things that we can do in a lab, big, uh, uh, what do you call it? Diagnostic lab. I'm trying to remember them. Yeah, there is a lab in every big city, right? So these are diagnostic labs. These are labs where they have, they take the sample, they do processing, and they, they find results. Sometimes they do culture. Sometimes they just mix chemicals and they find out results. Can we do that on a, on a small scale, in a chip format? When you, when you talk about chip, we are talking about a, a gadget that's self-contained. It has all the chemicals it would require to do the combinations or flowing, those things. And we look at the examples. That's a big area which is called lab on chip. And everything that we do, the ideal idea is that we should not need any human intervention. We you set things in motion and it should give a, a result. This, this, Word written here, high throughput screening, HTS. HTS is a major thing in drug delivery, uh, sorry, drug uh, discovery. HTS is a major thing in, in lots of bioanalytical things where they're looking for new chemicals that can work against a disease. Now they do it large scale. If you have lab on chip, you can do it small scale. Small scale means you would require less amount of samples and you can get quicker results. You can get quicker results and you can design a reader 
system with the computer, you can read results quickly. So lots of work has already happened, but hopefully with that's my idea that we read more and then we start talking about biomems here. Now, all this that we don't lab on chip, we have to learn from biochemists, biochemistry, pharmacists, all the folks who are already working with things in test tubes, right? So they're working in large scale. They're doing their reactions. They're mixing things already. So we say, okay, you have found some things. Let us put them in a small scale and we can do those things quicker and faster, right? So that helps in lots of direction, lots of dimension. Now, biosensors, we're talking about analyzing. So a lot of work in biomems is in biosensors. And what is a biosensor? Biosensor is something which can do chemical or physical transduction of selective targets. So selective is that if a test is supposed to detect, uh, I don't know, if, if it's supposed to detect one thing, it should not it should always detect that thing and it should not have any biofouling. It should not detect something which is not there or not detect something which is there. That's the concept of selectivity. Make sense? Selectivity is a very important word I highlighted. And quantitatively is, it should give us exact amount of how much is there, right? So now this can be within a living thing, but I got the definition from a paper. It can be within a living thing, it can be environment, just like we were talking like last lecture or lecture before, there are so many challenges. But that's where these kind of sensors can have big impact. Now we say biomems, but when we translate those biomems things into some active device, we call them biochips. So biochips are, are devices that are inspired for microelectronics to make things smaller. And they would do, again, delivery processing analysis or detection of biological molecules and species, right? And there's a whole range of things, cells, microorganisms, viruses, proteins, DNA, nucleic acids, and many more molecules of interest, viruses. Now we know the, the test for COVID, it's, it's a small biochip kind of thing, right? But they're still doing, we haven't been able to come up with a MEMS device yet where we can give a sample and it, it can do it by itself. But that's the idea of all those activities, right? Now, biomems have resulted into lots of new directions. New materials have been used up. We are using glass, we are using polymers. We are using even biological molecules themselves to create MEMS devices, MEMS structures, right? So some of the things will show up again and again. Like for example, uh, you will hear the word polymer like here, this is saying PDMS. PDMS will come up over and over because T PDMS is something that we use a lot to make microfluidic channels. When you say polymer, it is a rubbery material and we, we make it, uh, we remove all the bubbles and we heat it up, we make it from liquid to semi-solid. And then we make channels through it and we can run blood, we can run lots of other things and we can do mix and match. Just some material that became commonly used in, in this kind of application, biomems or microfluidic applications. All right, questions. Yeah, with the, the so we are still doing introduction because we, are, we soon will get into fabrication of semiconductor devices. And then we will see many of these, these things, how these can be made, right? So some biomems applications, this top left is, it's, it's an iconic thing. They call it uh, electrode, brain electrode. So University of Michigan came up with this many years ago and it's still used up till this day. So what you see is it's a very thin, micro scale kind of a needle, but it has electrodes on it. So they do these two to study neuronal activities. 
neuro applications have had major work going on where we want to make these very thin needles, but we want to have electrodes on those, those so we can measure the signal from neurons. So these top three are all examples of neural interfaces, right? You see those uh, neuronal cells grown on a surface of a chip as well. So we have uh, the low right is an example of cantilevers, right? So many cantilevers, when if they attach maybe a cell or whatever we are looking for, they would bend and their bending can be measured by many ways. So the idea is that now we are talking about single cell analysis or single virus kind of detection, right? The lower center is an example of actually making all the circuits on the chip as well. Hence we call it biochip. So this was one of my, when I was doing my PhD, one of my lab mates, he was working on this thing. So the idea is that you do the bio nano interface there as well, and you do the measurement and, and the signal processing on the same chip as well. All right, let's look at a couple of more slides and we can stop. There are examples on biomems where they are mixing different chemicals, they are flowing solutions and biosolutions. And then at some point, we get signal out of it or we measure the change in whatever uh, thing we decide that this is going to be the signal coming out. So it says here again, PDMS glass microchip. So PDMS is that polymer. We make design of uh, piping in it, we move solutions, and when there is a reaction, we can measure it or we put electrodes. There's so many ways how we do that. The idea is that we can micro scale do interaction of these things and make a system out of it that we can sell. And lots of system have been commercialized. These are some of the early, probably 15 years or so, what things have been commercialized where they can do chip-based detection of DNA, where they can do chip-based detection of uh, overexpression of some biomarkers. So biomarkers are, are molecules which may go high or low in their, their quantity, and they are measuring those things. Why we do this? We want to do this where we deploy it in field, maybe in a factory, maybe in, a, in stores, maybe on airports, military, where people may be exposed to things and they don't have uh, military, the, so they don't have the medical facilities all the way in the front. Those biochips can detect what's going on or, or what's in the system. All right. So these are few applications that 